All right, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome back to UW Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. My name is James and I'm one of the inpatient chief residents here at University of Washington Medical Center at the Montlake campus. And it's my pleasure today to introduce our panel for a packed Grand Rounds on a really important topic. Um, so we have three speakers and I'll introduce all of them now. Um, and then they'll sort of hand off to each other throughout the session. And at the end, we'll do question and answer um, for the entire panel. And so I invite you to submit your questions in the chat function. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. McClintock. Dr. McClintock is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Washington. She's a PCP here in the Women's Health Care Center, where she provides management of chronic diseases, outpatient gynecological issues, and family planning services. She also directs the Women's Healthcare Training Pathway for the IM residency. Her scholarly work focuses on women's health education across the continuum and psychological safety in medical education. Our second speaker is Dr. Nina Tan. Dr. Tan is an acting instructor within the Department of Medicine. She's a primary care provider at the UW Roosevelt Clinics and a breast health provider with the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Center Breast Health Team. She completed her training here at University of Washington with a focus on primary care and women's health and completed her UW Ambulatory Chief Resident Year last year. Her clinical and research interests include integrating family planning and reproductive health into primary care. Our third and final speaker is Dr. Beeman. Dr. Beeman is a volunteer clinical faculty member at University of California, San Francisco. She completed her residency at UCSF, where she served as an ambulatory chief resident and was, on, and was on faculty at San Francisco General Hospital. Her academic and research interests focus on the integration of medication abortion into the primary care setting, contraceptive decision making, and legal barriers to becoming an abortion provider. Currently, she provides direct clinical care and consultation to virtual healthcare clinics and organizations looking to expand medication abortion through telehealth services. Thank you all for being here and we look forward to a great discussion. Thank you and thanks for having us this afternoon. Um, what we hope to talk about today is ways that internists can support reproductive health in general and abortion in particular um, and continue to provide high quality evidence-based care to our patients through the many roles that we hold as clinicians, as educators, as patient advocates, and as community leaders. Our objectives today are to identify where and how abortion services are being limited across the country and in our region. Talk about integrating reproductive health services into the care that we already provide, regardless of specialty. Describe the training landscape for rising physicians and implications for future service availability locally and nationally, and identify opportunities and effective strategies for physician advocacy. So I want to start by just making it relevant to everybody. I think that we all can say that we treat patients who are 15 to 45 years old in our practice. We all at some time might prescribe a teratogenic medication or treat a disease process that might impact pregnancy. And given this, do you know whether your patient could become pregnant or whether your patient would want to be pregnant? And are you providing care that is aligned to that? So this is really some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Really, we are all providing care that is reproductive health aligned, even if we sort of aren't um, or don't think that we are before today. So I wanna start with an understanding of service availability and how abortion can be limited from a structural standpoint in ways that aren't just about gestational age, but also how services are made available to people geographically, financially, and through the consent process and gatekeeping. This is a map of our country, um, and this is taken from the Guttmacher Institute, which updates regularly um, their map of areas that are considered protective of abortion and areas that are considered restrictive of abortion. So you can see the red being areas that are more restrictive where we anticipate that whatever access is or was there is going to be removed or th severely threatened. And areas that are green, blue tend to be areas where we expect access to remain protected or expanded. And I wanna highlight that although we often think of this as a regional um, issue, it, even in our own region here of Washington, where we expect services to maintain their availability very closely, 
we have neighboring states like Idaho with very different policies um, and impacts to care. And also to just highlight, of course, we all know that we see patients from the entire Whammy region. So we see people here that may be going back to really restrictive areas where they live. So what I want to do to start is just take a compare Washington and Idaho and see how those two states are structuring the rules and regulations around abortion and the implications for patients. So in Washington, abortion policies currently in effect include abortion is banned at fetal viability, which is generally 24 to 26 weeks of pregnancy. State Medicaid funds can be used to cover abortion. Private health insurance plans are required to cover abortion. And qualified health professionals, meaning not solely physicians, can provide abortions. And there are specific protections for patients and abortion clinic staff. How does that translate to what patients have accessible to them within their state? So this is data, by the way, from 2020, so pre-Dobbs decision, but still the general principles will apply. So in Washington state, we have 40 clinics that provide abortion in 2020. 59% of Washington counties do not have an abortion provider in 2020, which translates to 10% of people 15 to 44 in Washington live in a county without an abortion provider in 2020. And the distance a person has to travel is 6, 10, or 14 miles one way in order to obtain an abortion at 12, 14, or 20 weeks, respectively. Let's compare that with our neighbor, Idaho. In Idaho, abortion is completely banned, except in very limited exceptions. Patients have to wait 24 hours after a mandatory counseling visit to obtain an abortion. And it doesn't have to be in person, but still imposes a waiting period. State Medicaid coverage of abortion is banned, except in very limited circumstances. Private health insurance coverage of abortion is banned, except in very limited circumstances. Parental consent or notice is required for a minor's abortion, and only physicians can provide abortions, not other qualified healthcare professionals. How does this translate to service availability in Washington, excuse me, in Idaho? In Idaho in 2020, pre-Dobbs, there were three clinics that provided abortion service. 95% of Idaho counties did not have an abortion provider in 2020. 67% of people 15 to 44 in Idaho lived in a county that did not have an abortion provider. And people had to travel 21, 36, or 286 miles one way in order to obtain an abortion at 12, 20, or 22 weeks. So in comparing these two states, we can see some of the ways that abortion is limited or restricted, again, that in ways that are not just related to gestational age. So some of the ways are physician and hospital requirements, you saw, gestational limits, public funding or private funding restrictions or mandates on how abortion services are paid for. Uh, in 45 states, providers themselves can refuse to provide abortion care based on their own ideology. And in 42 states, the entire institution can refuse to provide care based on their own ideology. So a common example is a Catholic healthcare system. Uh, 17 states have mandated counseling, and they often mandate certain things that must also be in the counseling. So some states uh, mandate things like they need to counsel on the ability of a fetus to feel pain at 12 weeks or long-term health consequences for patients who obtain abortions. There's also waiting periods and parental involvement or parental consent required in some states as well. So I hope that with this talk, you'll see the ways that any care we provide ultimately impacts the reproductive health care and informed choice for our patients. And this may be particularly important to keep in mind as we care for people who come to UW for care and go home to more restrictive environments in parts of the Whammy region. And as we hopefully start to engage patients in discussion about reproductive health as it pertains to your area of practice, we may come to that discussion from a place of pregnancy prevention and placing a high priority on planning or just the ability to plan because that is what we like to do. <laughs> um, it is still important from the standpoint of helping support healthy pregnancy in those who desire it and prevent pregnancy or the need to seek an abortion within a restrictive environment for those who do not wish to parent.
And we also want to keep in mind ways that our discussions might be experienced by patients despite our best intentions. And what I'm talking about here is just sort of what we both bring to the exam room and what we both bring to the conversation. So considering the historical context, for many of our patients, history will inform how people view and understand what's happening in the present. As we start to open discussions about pregnancy planning, we want to be aware and acknowledge the history of coercion, denial of consent, and withholding of information and thereby choice from BIPOC individuals, as well as people in other groups like people with disabilities or low socioeconomic status. And as we start these conversations, we want to ensure that our own values and biases about pregnancy and parenting um, coming from the place of pregnancy prevention aren't sort of inserted into discussion about reproductive health in ways that will be experienced as coercive. Here are some resources that I recommend and learned a lot from. Um, the Killing the Black Body is about coercion and control over a black body specifically. And the documentary Belly of the Beast is a present day example, a very recent example of forced sterilization in California prisons. That's a documentary film. And then I want us to consider also what we bring. So I'm going to ask you to reflect for a minute on these statements, and then um, I'll talk about them a little bit more as we go. So what are your immediate thoughts, sort of unfiltered immediate thoughts about the following? A woman with developmental delay and a seizure disorder tells you that she wishes to become pregnant. A person who's currently unhoused said that they would be okay either way if they became pregnant. Person with an A1C of 10 and uncontrolled hypertension tells you that they would like to become pregnant. An 18 year old that you treat for opiate use disorder and currently engages in transactional sex work comes to you because they are pregnant and haven't decided if they want to be a parent. They're and they're 10 weeks pregnant today. So I'll just go some through some comments about each of these one by one. Um, number one, lot, there is a lot of data that physicians do not regularly talk about reproductive and sexual health with people who have disabilities, and it's thought to be from the belief that they are not sexually active, which we know is not the case. For this particular person, their seizure disorder uh, medications might be teratogenic, and there's an opportunity to support healthy pregnancy in this person by considering a switch in medication if possible, or giving them information about how their medications might impact a pregnancy now rather than a simple statement about you should not get pregnant right now, for example. Um, a person who you may have beliefs about who, when, where, and how people should parent, and this may impact how you counsel a patient and um, about medications or pregnancy planning. For this case number two, how do you feel about that ambivalence? We certainly prefer black, white, binary answers to these questions as the person who's going to plan their care. But how might we change our counseling and our care based on the information that they could become pregnant? Uh, for number three, do we talk to our patients about the impacts of their chronic disease on a fetus or themselves in pregnancy as part of our counseling about complications of uncontrolled disease? Patients don't always have the same information that we do about pregnancy complications in chronic disease. And you and this patient may share a goal of a healthy pregnancy for them, and in that case might be able to decide together to delay temporarily while disease is optimized, or provide information about possible complications and support informed choice for the patient by supporting them and then connecting them with prenatal care early. And lastly, people who engage in stigmatized behaviors are known to be treated and counseled differently in our system. And you may have opinions about whether or not this person sort of quote unquote should become a parent right now, but how could you approach the conversation with an open-ended questions that really center their own values and goals and their own autonomy in decision-making? And just to highlight that this is neither historical nor theoretical, here's a study from 2016. Physicians were asked to counsel each of these women in a vignette on contraceptive methods, with each person presented once to reflect a higher socioeconomic status and once to represent a lower socioeconomic status. And in this study, women of color and women perceived to be of lower socioeconomic status were more likely to be recommended to limit their family size and offered surgical or LARC methods versus women who were white or perceived higher socioeconomic status. 
Um, and even the way that we counsel patients has an impact. There, um, specifically, even just us suggesting a particular method to a patient can impact how happy they are with their method and whether they continue to use it. So in terms of how our goal about how to approach conversations in reproductive health and pregnancy with our patients, the reproductive justice movement can give us a framework for how we might start to think about those conversations. This is an organization focused on reproductive justice, which they define as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, not to, to not have children, and the right to parent the children in safe and sustainable communities. And as we center, as we enter these conversations more and more about pregnancy and planning, um, our goal is to hear what our patients need and support their ability to make informed choices that honor their autonomy and reproductive health as they define it. So more practically speaking, what can you do in your practice? And again, I view this as regardless of your specialty. We can think of this as being care along a continuum, and from the planning perspective, we can um, optimize chronic conditions and medication use for people who to help prepare people for healthy pregnancy. We can support uh, preventing pregnancy and those who don't desire it. We can provide abortion services or build access to care and connect people with care in an easy, low barrier fashion and ensure adequate post-abortion care for people seeking services in our more protective practice environment. So planning, talk to your patients about their chronic health conditions in pregnancy and how their medications that you prescribe might impact pregnancy. I, as a practice, try to include a question about pregnancy planning anytime I am prescribing a new medication or giving a refill on something that might be not might be contraindicated in pregnancy. So things to consider when you're deciding whether or not to refill the medication or prescribe a new one. Will it impact this person's fertility? Will it reduce efficacy of their contraception? Is it a teratogen? Or do you recommend that your patient have birth control while they take it? Um, a question that you can use, practically speaking, is do you think you'd like to become pregnant in the next year is a very common one. There are some other frameworks, but I think this is for the purposes of this um, talk is a perfectly good one. We can also help prevent pregnancy for people who do not want to parent. Check with them whether or not they could become pregnant. Are they thinking about pregnancy? If they are not thinking about pregnancy, do they have a way to prevent it? Um, connect people with resources for contraception. If you think that that's not going to be within your scope of practice, know how to get them those services that they are requesting. You can also include a statement about availability of abortion and your allyship into your contraceptive counseling if you are a prescriber. Um, so as one statement might be something like, you talk about the methods that the person is interested in, and then you might say, and if ever you're pregnant and decide that you don't want to be a parent right now, you can always call me and I can help connect you to resources, um, services or options counseling. And emergency contraception for everyone. If you're prescribing contraception, it's very helpful to also prescribe emergency contraception at the same time, sort of as like a blanket policy for anyone who's sexually active and is not wanting to have a pregnancy. Another tool for people who do want to prescribe um, contraception is just a reminder about the medical eligibility criteria and the standard practice recommendations from the CDC. This is, this is a screenshot of the table that they have that basically describes medical conditions and then subconditions that might occur under, under that disease process followed by whether or not a person would be recommended to continue or to initiate a specific method. And that's one option for accessing that information in the context of counseling. There's also the um, an app that you can get, which is just um, CDC contraception, and that is free and very, very easy to use quickly in the outpatient setting. You can connect your patients with abortion services should they come to you asking for resources. Abortionfinder.org is um, a directory that's very comprehensive and is full of trusted and verified abortion service providers that you can connect your patient with. At UW specifically, we have some resources. There's the Women's Healthcare Center at Roosevelt, where Nina and I work. 
their clinic, our clinic has complex family planning trained OBGYNs and IM providers who can provide medication abortion. At the Northgate Clinic, there's also a family planning clinic staffed mostly by family medicine, providing medical and procedural abortions and other family planning services. You yourself can learn to prescribe um, mefepristone or the medication abortion pill. Um, here is one option for training is an online training that you also can get CME credit for. Um, when I think about this being in scope, it really is. It's a medication that we take some, potentially take some lab work, um, prescribe a medication and follow up with somebody. And this is the bread and butter of an internist job. So I think more and more we'll start hopefully seeing that this is something that general internal medicine physicians are taking on or pro all providers. Post-abortion care. Complications are rare, but they include incomplete abortion, which is retained products of conception, hemorrhage, infection, uterine perforation, anesthesia-related complications, and uterine rupture. Our goal, even if we're not going to be the person providing services to care for these complications, is to still provide a non-judgmental post-abortion care when the need for it is recognized and help. There are also post-abortion hotlines available that Jess will talk about. Recognize, too, that especially in restrictive environments, we may be hearing more and more people seeking miscarriage management services rather than abortion services. Um, there are some trainings available for physicians to manage miscarriage in their clinic, and that is this organization here is one that is led by UW faculty. So before I hand it to Nina, I just want to sort of remind everybody that every any care that you provide is reproductive health care, and um, it will have an impact on the reproductive health of our patients. No matter what your area of practice is, there are ways that you can support the health, informed choice, and access to evidence-based and high-quality care for our patients through very simple actions, statements, or connections to resources. And I'm going to turn it over to Nina. Thanks, Addy. Okay, so um, even though abortion is common and safe, it is heavily regulated medical service, which leads to restricted access, as Addy uh, just discussed. Traditionally, abortion was thought of as a subspecialty or even a family medicine issue. However, and especially in the past couple of years um, with the COVID pandemic, there has been more discussion in the internal medicine uh, community about our role in providing medication abortions. And so I'm gonna be talking about uh, training internists to provide medication abortion. I wanna start by putting this idea into context. There have been a couple of prior single institution studies from the early 2000s to even some published this year that have addressed a few aspects of integrating medication abortion into internal medicine and primary care. And the first is that patients are interested in receiving medication abortions from their primary care provider with whom they already have an established therapeutic relationship. Second is that trainees believe that medication abortion could be within their scope of practice and they would like to provide this care. And then third is that faculty are also interested in being trained to provide and to precept medication abortion cases. So with this in mind, I worked with Addie and Helene Starks on a project that was funded by a grant from the Society of Family Planning with the goal of better understanding the landscape of internal medicine training. And this was more broadly for a few different stigmatized conditions, but included abortion, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, opioid use disorder, and gender affirming care, all of which uh, you know, medications can be used for first-line management. Um, so we did this by surveying leaders at internal medicine primary care residency programs to collect information about what training is offered at their program. Um, and we did have a low response rate, unfortunately, at 28%. However, this was uniform. The, the response rate was uniform across the different regions that we sampled. So we did feel like it was um, nationally representative, like no one region was overrepresented. And I also want to note that this data was collected just prior to the Dobbs the Jackson Women's Health Organization decision uh, earlier this year. So uh, 
First, we asked program leaders whether they think medication abortion is even within the scope of primary care. And what we found was that the majority of program leaders agreed or strongly agreed that medication abortion is within the scope of primary care. We also found that an even bigger majority of respondents agree or strongly agree that access to medication abortion is limited in primary care settings. However, the training that's offered in internal medicine primary care programs doesn't necessarily reflect this generally supportive opinion um, of, of program leaders. And although there are quite a few programs that offer didactics and or elective clinical experiences, almost half of programs don't currently offer medication abortion training opportunities. And furthermore, looking towards the future of training, um, over half of programs do not currently have plans to integrate medication abortion into residency training. And again, this was pre dogs just to highlight the timing. And so thinking about what stands in the way of integrating abortion training into internal medicine uh, uh, training, we asked program leaders to identify the perceived barriers to training residents to prescribe medication abortion. And I broke these down into three more broad categories, resource barriers, institutional barriers, and regulatory barriers. And I'll talk about each one and highlight a few ways that we can address some of these barriers. So first, we'll talk about the resource barriers that were identified, which included a range of things um, from lack of trained internal medicine faculty preceptors to a lack of backup or support in the clinic, and also that medication abortion is already provided by other specialties at the institution. Um, a few ways to address some of these barriers. First, uh, you know, of course, with uh, the of course, resources are limited. And so first starting with individual and institutional buy-in that um, reproductive healthcare is part of routine care across specialties, as Addy discussed earlier. And especially the idea that primary care providers are well poised to counsel patients and provide early management of many reproductive health issues, including medication abortion. And then additionally, rather than siloing the service to other specialties, we can create opportunities to ally ourselves with our colleagues in different specialties and work with them to care for our patients. And then third is training internal medicine faculty. Of course, training just a few faculty members can have an amplifying effect, especially if demand for training opportunities exceeds supply, such as here at, at UW, um, because of course one faculty member can go on to train other faculty as well as residents, et cetera. And there are many training toolkits out there, which you've already heard about, and you'll hear more about later as well. Um, and these are a great way for trainees or faculty champions to learn how to prepare a clinic and individual providers to prescribe medication abortion. And one that I just want to quickly plug here is, is a toolkit called Access Delivered, which was created by UW Family Medicine faculty in collaboration with this organization, Plan C, which provides patients with at-home abortion pill options. So moving on to institutional barriers, uh, these ranged from institutional leadership not being supportive to religious policies that prevented um, training. And I wanna highlight this point about how religious affiliation can affect residency training as a whole. There was an ob guyne study that looked at training opportunities at programs where uh, residents spend 70% or more of their time at a faith-based hospital. And of these programs, 12% did not offer any abortion training and were not even meeting ACGME requirements for this topic um, when compared to 5% of programs when you look at both uh, religiously affiliated and non-religiously affiliated. So I wanted to discuss this for two reasons. One is that on the whole, we can't necessarily assume that abortion services are provided by other specialties, especially in other parts of the country where abortion is not as supported as it is here in, in Seattle or in Washington. And second is that with the increasing number of hospital mergers, we need to consider how this impacts resident training and the future of our healthcare workforce in general. 
So returning back to a few ways that we can address these institutional barriers. One option is of course having discussions with leadership to find out if there is institutional support and if not, why? Um, if yes, what type of support is offered? Is it sort of informal verbal discussion based or is it integrated into policies and, and you know, formalized in that way? Um, second, medicine is team based. So making sure that staff and providers who are hired are on board with the services that are provided by a clinic. And then third is ensuring that training is not affected by mergers, especially as mergers continue to happen more and more. So moving on to our last category, which is regulatory barriers. Um, one data point I wanted to highlight is that 40% of respondents were unsure whether there are even regulatory barriers to providing abortion training. For example, whether there are state or federal laws or certification requirements. Uh, and this is certainly not surprising uh, and maybe a, a reflection of a couple different things. For example, the amount of misinformation and fear that's out there about abortion in general, um, these constantly changing laws that are often vague and can be interpreted in many different ways, um, and a general lack of education about abortion. And many of these things do stem from general stigma and politicization of abortion. And while we are discussing the regulatory environment, um, I do wanna highlight a recent development about abortion provision at the Veterans Affairs sites, which is that the VA released a statement in the past month that was supportive of abortion counseling, as well as provision of abortion, though with some exceptions. It's, uh, the statement states that when the life or health of the pregnant veteran would be endangered is when abortion would be um, provided through the VA. And it remains to be seen how this will be interpreted and implemented, but this is certainly an encouraging step forward. So, um, you know, most important in our current landscape is uh, clear education about the laws and regulations surrounding abortion, whether it's at the organizational level it, with formal education about it or just individual uh, directed learning. And then of course, our roles as advocates for our patients, which Jess will discuss more now. So our final section today is gonna to focus on opportunities for advocacy and strategic partnerships for both physicians as well as patients. And we hope to share with you to increase awareness and resources for helping patients during these uncertain times. So as we mentioned, this is an ever shifting landscape. We know the political and geographical landscape is changing and has led to numerous clinic closures, as well as a movement of patient care across state lines and amongst institutions. The two organizations who have been tracking this very closely are the Guttmacher Institute on the left, as well as the Center for Reproductive Rights, which has created this map, which allows you to be able to track legislation closely in your state. Both of these organizations do update the policies um, on a weekly and ongoing basis, um, and so are something that we wanted to make sure to point you to, to increase awareness. Navigating this uncertainty is surely going to require networks and allies. As Nina pointed out, in the pre-Dobbs world, we face challenges to training physicians, and specifically those of us in less traditional family planning oriented fields, such as internal medicine, and this, this trend is only likely to be exacerbated in these current times. So we will need to partner and lean on our existing networks, create new relationships, and strengthen the allyship to prepare to care for patients during this time. And in addition, we know that care for our most complex patients will also require these relationships and partnerships between generalists and specialists at our institutions as it always has, and that is an increase um, in, uh, in the concern as well as the need for this, given the morbidity and mortality associated with carrying pregnancies to term. And there have been significant shifts in patient care, not only across state lines, as I mentioned, but also in where the care is taking place. So patients are seeking pre and post abortion care in primary care settings, urgent care settings, as well as ER settings. And there's also been an increase in patients who are self-managing their abortions outside of our traditional brick and mortar clinical settings. And finally, there's been a movement towards the creation and streamlining of legal resources to help mitigate the risk for both patients as well as clinicians. 
after a talk of this nature, people often are asking themselves, where do I start? And so I'd like us to focus on some of the opportunities that live in the high impact and low effort zone. And to start, the following are three concrete ways to engage after this talk. The first is simply to share with someone, a colleague, a friend, a family member who has either been in attendance here or who is interested in this topic area or not, um, to continue the dialogue about something you have learned or are interested in exploring further after this talk. There's also many online advocacy networks, but one that has been particularly strong in the post-ops world is the Reproductive Health Access Project, or the RAP group. They have regional in-person and virtual meetings to meet a cohort of interested and dedicated individuals in your state and region, as well as a virtual national internal, internal medicine cluster, um, including other faculty members and practitioners who share a commitment to reproductive health. And here's the QR code in case you're interested in signing up for that. And then finally, there's action alerts. And there's many of these. They come from Planned Parenthood, another group, If When How, about legal regulations. And I've particularly found the Care Collective to be one that has increased during this time to share biweekly national newsletters that provide action items for physicians as well as legislative updates. And then thinking more uh, specifically about opportunities that are available for both physicians as well as resources for patients, I'd like to share some final additional opportunities for ongoing advocacy in relation to abortion care. The physician-focused opportunities that I'll present today relate to local and state efforts, sign-on letters, and leadership training, as well as CME opportunities. And the following are the specific examples of how these efforts have taken place in the last month. So California um, has created through the Department of Healthcare Services, has set up a billing pathway to bill for abortions directly. As Nina mentioned, FQHCs have often noted that it's difficult in their payment structure, structure to be able to be reimbursed for abortion care services. And so this is a new billing pathway that allows individuals to, uh, it's a payment strategy, strategy that allows FQHCs, rural health clinics, as well as tribal health centers to use similar billing pathways as they do for Medicaid programs or other public health programs. And this allows the FQHCs to be reimbursed for the abortion services that they provide without having to use any of the federal funds. And that has been typically the main barrier for supportive states in expanding abortion care to their populations. The following is um, our two sign-on letters that have recently been distributed. Um, and the, they are examples of ways in which individuals can sign on within less than a minute um, to be able to support major efforts across the country. The one on the left was asking major media outlets to stop quoting anti-abortion rhetoric in the news, given the dangerous and false narratives that could potentially be interpreted as fact by individuals. And the second is a sign-on letter for physicians and organizations, which was written to Google asking them to stop advertisements and as well as promoting crisis pregnancy centers on both their search and map functions. And then finally, as Addy had mentioned, the abortion pill CME is an opportunity to be able to view videos um, in clinical vignettes showing um, the ease of which medication abortion services can be rolled out in the ambulatory care setting, as well as there's leadership opportunities specifically for um, doctors within our field of internal medicine, as well as non-traditional family planning uh, focused uh, specialties. Um, and you're, you're able to learn from experts on how to advocate for abortion care, as well as uh, including dedicated media and leadership training. And then to focus on what resources are available for patients, I would like to share some of the most high yield resources that patients are using at this time. It truly has been inspiring to see how many national groups and organizations are continuing their commitment as well as creating new resources for patients to access care and help support patients who are managing their abortions, either through the help of uh, virtual partners in clinic or at home. And so I'll highlight these in the next few slides. These are the four resources that I use most often in my everyday work. Abortion funds and the National Abortion Federation's abortionfinder.org site, which Addie had mentioned previously, are truly inst instrumental to connecting patients to care as well as clinics across the country. And then direct referrals are available in getting to know your local clinics at the organization that you work with, as well as in your local area, 
are incredibly helpful to help streamline care for patients in, uh, insofar as warm handoffs and consultations are available for patients. And the final two resources on this page are the hotlines that are available for patients, such as All Options, which is an opportunity for those who may not feel as comfortable doing options counseling for their patients. And so it's a nice referral where patients are able to speak with, uh, with dedicated and trained counselors on what their options are, as well as Exhale, which is a supportive resource that I provide for all my patients um, to be able to have an active text line and phone support that's available 24 seven for them to talk through any of their experience related to abortion. I Need an A is an, an organization that has actually just started within the last two months. Um, and this is a, a practical service organization. So they are focused on connecting patients to care, but most importantly, they're connecting patients with housing resources, uh, uh, funding for gas, practical needs such as childcare related to being able to access abortion care, especially for patients who have to travel across state lines. And then finally, Self-managed abortions uh, are being increasingly supported by the MA hotline that started a few years ago. It's called the Miscarriage and Abortion Hotline. And I wanted people to know about this, not only for the support that it's been providing thousands of patients, and they've seen a significant increase in their volume of care for patients, but also this is an excellent opportunity for those people who are interested in receiving training on how to support patients who are experiencing miscarriage at home, as well as who are self-managing their abortions. And they've had, they now have a, a group of 50 volunteer physicians who are caring for patients, but they see their volume growing all the time. And so a nice opportunity for both, uh, to both highlight a resource for patients, as well as an opportunity as, as far as volunteering in a clinical role for uh, miscarriage and abortion patients. So in summary, We've discussed how abortion services are limited both through legal and structural mechanisms. And this truly is reducing the availability of these services as well as not only creating, but worsening the, obstacle, the obstacles to abortion access that have been present in our country. And just to highlight again, that any care you're providing is reproductive health care for many of our patients. You will be the person who's seeing them for their primary care. And so knowing your role and how important that is for them. And that medication abortion is definitely within our scope of practice. We've talked about the abortion training barriers and there truly are uh, barriers to being able to get this training, but they are surmountable. And this is something that general internists as well as specialists can be providing for their patients. And then I encourage you to find a high impact, low effort strategy that you'd like to employ or another uh, one of these resources that you'd like to explore in the future. And we want to thank you all for your time, and we are grateful to be able to share this with you. Um, this QR code is, um, feel free to, uh, we don't have any trainings planned, but feel free to sign up and um, we will contact everyone um, when the next training is planned. Great. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you for a really great uh, discussion. Um, if folks want to put their questions in the chat, we'll, we have some time for Q&A for the whole panel. Um, the first question I see here popping up is, um, how can a physician find out about their legal liability and how will their institution protect them and their patients if they provide abortion care to a pregnant person from a restrictive state? I'm happy to take that question. Um, I think it's incredibly important to think about that. And that's part of the logistical piece of being able to provide abortion care. I think that many of the institutions that we've been affiliated with or are affiliated with do have quite expansive malpractice insurance or coverage. And so I think it does start with a conversation with risk management, whether there's um, obstetric services that are not covered, if miscarriage management would, would it be covered or elective abortion. And so that conversation typically does start with risk management. I think that also um, then ends up being a discussion of kind of thinking about clinical services um, that are provided um, for individuals either at your institution if you're a part of that, or if you're, if you're thinking about having an outside or external partnership. Um, in terms of telehealth or virtual services and thinking about being in a protective state and providing care for a restrictive state, 
Um, all of the care we consider for telehealth uh, that is provided is under the jurisdiction of wherever that patient is. Um, and so uh, really thinking about there are some organizations that are providing care for patients who are in more restrictive states, um, which could certainly be a concern for liability as far as um, uh, malpractice insurance or your, lic your clinical license. Um, but for those patients who are traveling to your care, knowing that they are, those patients are protected um, in the state that they're receiving receiving that care and they're under that jurisdiction of whatever the abortion um, laws are within that state. Great. And then another question for Dr. McClintock and maybe Dr. Tan um, is just thinking internally about sort of our UW network. I think you mentioned the uh, Roosevelt Women's Healthcare Center and the Northgate Family Medicine Clinic as two places. If folks are working at other primary care clinics within sort of the UW system, if they're trained, are they able to provide those services there or is it sort of on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, UW in general has been very clear that they are an organization supportive of abortion services. And so from that perspective, you are certainly allowed um, as long as you've received some training. The issue that can come up is this REMS certification, um, which we did not talk too much about, but there is some, um, again, restriction on um, the medication itself. But typically what happens is one provider within a like clinic unit will be um, will go through a very not hard training um, and be able to then have the pills at in the clinic um, to be dispensed. And so that is, it's doable. A lot of the toolkits that Nina mentioned, like Access Delivered, and there's also one from Teach, um, talk really specifically about implementation. So in short, any clinic that is feeling prepared to, or, you know, interested can. Um, there are a couple sort of regulatory hoops to jump through, but they're not, you know, like Jess said, they're, they're surmountable. They're not too much. Does that answer the question? I don't know, Nina, do you have anything to add to that? Or Jess, since you do a lot of implementation? The only thing to consider is just thinking about, um, you know, if you're a trainee, are there um, faculty members who can sort of still oversee that with you? Um, that can be a challenge um, as well as we start to see it come up more in internal medicine. So it's something to consider there. Um, another question just around is about, could you talk a little bit about if there are plans to help protect providers um, from a loss of anonymity if they're providing these services? I think there were a few case examples where folks were sort of very publicly advertised as providing states and restrictive states that have created some fear in the community generally. I'm happy to speak to that as well. I think, you know, um, I, there's certainly a loss of anonymity, I think, here, but at the same time, many of the organizations that are providing this care um, are very protective of the individuals who are engaged in the care. And so um, they offer the ability to, you know, many of many of these organizations do not advertise publicly who are the people who are affiliated with their care um, and go through measures to protect. There's also um, the National Abortion Federation, I will say, has been a huge resource during this time for individuals. And so just as we've mentioned toolkits for rolling out um, uh, rolling out abortion care services, they also have toolkits for individuals which are growing all the time with information about digital uh, digital digital privacy protections um, and are great ways to kind of start exploring if this is you know of a concern, which surely it is for many of us um, to think about what are those personal protections going to be? What is my level of anonymity that I want? What is my level of risk that I'm willing risk tolerance that I'm willing to take on in order to engage in this care. Um, and then I think some of it is also thinking about um, if there's any gonna, gonna be any kind of stigma or concern for community, um, uh, local kind of more retaliation or, um, or safety. Those are all considerations that anyone in this space certainly does um, consider when taking on this work. Um, but there are quite a few toolkits resources available to specifically people who want to maintain as much privacy as possible and thinking about um, what are the public registry and information that's available out there for us as physicians, just thinking about our licensing boards and kind of what addresses, phone numbers, things are available for the public to um, access. 
Um, but many people go through great lengths to protect those affiliations for clinicians um, working working on site or working virtually. Great. And then Dr. McClintock, you had mentioned um, anytime that you're starting someone on new contraception, that you also prescribe emergency contraception as a part of that. Um, and I think that's a practice pattern that is maybe not as common. And I was just curious um, if that is universally covered by insurance the same way contraceptives are, or if folks have to pay out of pocket for that if you're doing it. Um, and if there are any other considerations we should be thinking about if we're, we're thinking about adopting that practice ourselves. Um, so one form of emergency contraception plan B is available over the counter, but sometimes will be cheaper if um, prescribed by a physician or um, free. One thing to keep in mind is that currently the recommendation if people have um, are a little bit overweight and Nina or Jess, you might need to remind me off the top of my head what the BMI um, recommendation is, but that they should be given Ella, which is a different type of emergency contraception. That honestly can sometimes be harder to find, but would be covered under like a prescription drug plan if somebody has one. Um, but that is probably the like easiest, best option just because it's more inclusive, like anybody can use it. And um, it's uh it's good for five days after inter unprotected intercourse, whereas plan B, I think, is 72 hours still. And the BMI cutoff for that is 30 for um, plan B. And then for Ella, the BMI cutoff is 35. Um, and that's just due to the effectiveness. So people do use it above those BMI levels, but then it's with counseling to the patients. Great. Um, and then one last question, unless other folks have things they want to put in the chat, um, I was just thinking a little bit more about, again, sort of legal protections for providers. Um, are folks in restrictive states at risk if physicians suggest sort of information using their cell phones? And there's a lot of concern about sort of online tracking and curious if you have thoughts about that. I think this is such an important question, and I think that there's not going to be a really concrete answer to it. Unfortunately, I, you know, there's many companies that I think are are trying to come out and and really strengthen their privacy policies as far as what's going to be um, available if there were any kind of investigation, and and as far as insofar as how much uh, tracking is available to kind of go through. Um, you know, I will say many of us clinicians who are providing care um, for patients. Um, who are accessing care legally, but are going back to a state um, in which they, in which it's more restrictive. Many of us do do a lot of our conversations by phone and, and feel that that's protective for patients in some ways. Um, I think it's, you know, a, a lot of us also use HIPAA protected platforms, which is obviously just good practice, but also has an extra layer of security for patients as well. Um, and then I think it's important just to know there are many Know Your Rights campaigns that are out there. Um, the Center for Reproductive rights has a really nice one that's put together, which allows patients to also understand um, if they are ever in a clinical situation or in a situation in which uh, they're being um, told they're going to be investigated for the care that they've sought out, um, what their rights are um, as far as uh, sharing any information if they have to um, and, and kind of provide scripts for patients that are available. Because we know that, you know, us as, as Clinicians are vulnerable, but certainly our patients are are much more vulnerable and less protected than we are, and we hold a place of, of privilege in comparison to them. And so um, a lot of these organizations are creating more general language, um, not necessarily legal advice, but kind of um, uh, information that can be given to patients so that they can be protected. Um, but I think more is yet to see about kind of tracking and, and how much we're going to be protected by that as, as far as uh, communicating with patients. Great. Um, and as we're wrapping up, I just want to highlight, I, I believe what I heard, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Dr. McClintock and Dr. Tan both sort of shared an openness to continue to be leaders for us within our institution as in our department as we start to navigate this evolving crisis over the next few years. And so I think we'll continue to learn more about our role and 
and educate ourselves and supporting our patients as we as we walk through this. Um, so I'm really grateful to everyone for joining us today for Grand Rounds uh, and thankful to, to our speakers um, for sharing their wisdom with us. We'll see you all again in two weeks. Um, and yes, for those asking the slides and, and the video will be up on our Grand Rounds website next week. Have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you for having us.